Hi, I'm Anthony Gosher, consultant, spinal neurosurgeon and founder of the Spine MDT. Uh, recently, I posted a video titled Why Surgery for Back Pain Doesn't Work. Um, and a lot of my videos and topics are about how to avoid surgery for back pain, how to manage spinal problems um, without surgery. But in this video, I'm going to give you some scenarios when spine surgery might actually be the right answer. So in my practice, the primary reason is to protect neurological function. So the most, most patients I operate on are starting to lose some function in either their arms or their legs from a trapped or compressed spinal cord or a trapped nerve in the cervical, thoracic or lumbar spine. So some examples are slip disc in the cervical spine, the neck part of the spine, or stenosis, narrowing, overall narrowing of the canal in the cervical spine, causing spinal cord compression, where patients come to me with loss of function of the arms and legs, difficulty walking because of weakness. So the idea of surgery is to arrest that immediately and try and preserve the current neurological function. That's usually depending on what's causing the compression that's from an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion where we go in from the front of the neck um, remove the disc as shown in this diagram here that's the going in from the front of the neck removing the disc uh, it's a side view here of the disc being removed and the spinal cord being decompressed and then in its place putting in one of these cages in that in, in its place to allow the bones to fuse together. Similarly, if a slip disc is not compressing the spinal cord, but pinching the nerve here on the way out of the spine, then, and causing arm weakness, um, then an operation to come in from the back of the spine, in this case a uh, cervical foraminotomy, to make a little window here and widen the gap to free up the nerve to preserve the function of the arm alone, um, is a reason. Similarly, in the lumbar spine, lower down a slip disc, pinching a nerve on the way out, we would carry out a microdiscectomy where we again create a window at the back of the spine, shave away the disc and try and preserve the function of that leg if that's causing leg weakness and not just sciatica. And in both those last cases, let's say you don't have weakness of the arm and it's just pain down the arm or in the context of the disc slipped in the lumbar spine and you just have pain shooting down the leg but no weakness. I would operate if that has failed conservative measures such as physiotherapy, manipulations by an osteopath and a good number of weeks have passed, the pain hasn't improved, these measures have failed, then I'd consider surgery um, and often an injection sometimes would help um, and there has been a study, the nerve trial, that has demonstrated similar results. Obviously it depends on the size of the disc, the amount of compression. Uh, and things like that. So that's a bit of a judgment call by the surgeon, but these are scenarios where I would consider surgery. Another condition is spinal stenosis. Um, if this has failed conservative measures, and often it does because you've got narrowing of the spine caused by a combination of thickened ligaments, slightly bulging discs, and then thickened facet joints, the bones, uh, the joints between each spinal segment at the back of the spine as all of that thickens up it narrows the channel down the middle of the spine that all the nerves run through and it's, it's very difficult to try and untrap those nerves with um, manipulations or physiotherapy or, or, or things like that things like that. Talked about indirect dynamic disc decompression therapy or IDD therapy for this condition where you're strapped to this um, very special table here that puts traction, stretches you at very specific points related to the area of narrowing in your spine. And the trouble with that is if the stenosis is predominantly as shown here by some bulges in the discs and the discs are still soft, then yes, if you apply traction, i.e try and pull these bones apart a little bit you do get this kind of suctioning effect or vacuum effect where the disc sucks back a little bit um, and then creates space around the spine equally by stretching out the ligaments those thickened ligaments at the back of the spine that can create space but the trouble is often the narrowing is caused by a combination of these things and often it's bony the actual facet joints the bones around the joints actually thicken up so there's no manipulation or no amount of um, exercise is going to shrink that unfortunately and the symptoms often persist and i recently interviewed stuart mcgill and even he someone who 
um, manages spine disease as a kinesiologist with various therapies. The McGill Big Three is quite well known for that. Um, he, even he agrees that we still need spine surgeons for conditions such as spinal stenosis, where he feels that's probably one of the areas where it's more effective than many other treatments. And for that, the operation I tend to do is a minimally invasive posterior lumbar decompression, where this is a cross section um, along the spine. It's a small incision. And then under the microscope, a special retraction set comes in to try and move or displace the muscles. You make a small window in the arch at the back of the spine. And then you through that through that window under the microscope, you just undercut and remove all that overgrown bone and ligament to try and widen uh, this canal here. Then there are fractures of the spine, either caused by um, quite high velocity or quite high impact trauma, or if you have underlying brittle bones, so osteoporosis, osteopenia, where lower impact can cause crumbling of the bones and collapse of the bone. In the latter, most of the time, the spinal cord and the nerves are not at risk. And these fractures tend to heal on, on their own, the majority do. If they're continuing to collapse and the pain has worsened and gone on beyond six weeks or so, then I tend to carry out a procedure called a vertebroplasty or sometimes a kyphoplasty where um, just through a very small nick in the skin, you inject, you pass a needle through the bone into the vertebral body and inject some cement. Sometimes you can inflate a balloon to help in expand, re-expand the bone before injecting the cement. That just helps stabilize things and alleviate the pain. In the context of more unstable fractures, um, where the arches at the back of the spine may be broken or the spinal cord itself is in danger, then a more extensive operation is required where we place screws in um, into the bones and rods to kind of give a support or scaffolding to the segment um, that's unstable. Um, sometimes um, you also need to decompress or so remove bone at the back of the spine to take pressure off the spinal cord. If it's just continuing to collapse but the spinal cord has room around it, but you are concerned as a surgeon that things may get worse with time, then the operation to just stabilize it at the back is fairly minimally invasive. It's just usually four nicks to the skin and four screws into the spine. Once the bone has healed up fully, the screws can then later be removed. So fractures are potentially one cause of instability, but we also have another cause called uh, spondylolisthesis, where one bone of the spine slips forward over the other bone over time. And that's either due to weakening of the joints at the back of the spine or a kind of stress fracture in the arch at the back called the pars, where that just is a defect that forms in it over time. And, over, and then it just allows one bone to slip forward ever so slightly. And that in itself can put the nerves uh, that run through the canal at risk of compression. In that scenario, spondylolisthesis, the operation I usually do is called a minimally invasive transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion, or T-lift for short. But the version I do is the MIS T-lift, which is a minimally invasive operation through two very small incisions in the lower back. Um, the two bones that we have to stabilize, we put a construct of four screws, um, so two in each bone and then connect the heads of those screws with rods. So this is a cross section again of the spine. The screw, you try and get it into a pedicle of the bone. That way you miss this central spinal canal where the nerves are. You do that at the bone uh, below and above the disc space where there's instability. And then you connect them up with these two rods. And then you then remove the disc material between the two bones. Again, this is a cross section. And in its place, this is the disc, in its place you place a metal cage or a titanium cage with some bone craft. And over time that allows the two bones to fuse up and join up as one bone. The metalwork itself then is obsolete, but you don't remove it because it's buried nice and deep. Once everything's fused up, things are stable. And in the process of doing the procedure as well, you decompress and protect the nerves. And finally, I want to talk about surgery for non-specific back pain. That's a term I hate. There's no such thing as non-specific. It's non-pathological. Um, and by that, I mean where there isn't really an underlying disease that you can identify on a scan and truly say um, that's the source of the pain. And that's why a lot of my videos, especially the one about um, why spine surgery for back pain doesn't work, is so important. Um, there was a trend of surgery infusing the spine 
in patients who had some mild wear and tear in the spine shown between the discs, which is actually a very normal finding uh, in humans as we cross the age of 40, say. It's very normal to get wear and tear and you cannot definitely say that's the source of your pain. And we know that because many patients who underwent fusion for that without being thoroughly investigated did not receive any benefit at all. So surgery for back pain, I'm not talking about trapped nerves, purely for pain in the back, is a difficult one because you have to prove or try and find where that pain is coming from. Um, and there are very few things in the spine um, that would cause back pain where surgery is going to be the answer. So here's an example of an MRI scan with on so, someone who had chronic back pain. They've done a load of physiotherapy, you know, they've lost a load of weight. Um, they've had injections to the spine here and there. Things have got better temporarily with the injections when the lower segment of the spine here, where there's some abnormal abnormality shown here, um, they had an injection in this region, had temporary alleviation. So let's look at this MRI scan. This is the front of the spine, the back of the spine. And these are the bones, the vertebrae that make up the spine. And in between, we have discs. On this specific sequence of MRI scan, we call this the stir sequence. When there's sort of um, fluid or fluid buildup edema, what we call it in the bones, it glows on this, on this sequence around this disc here that's flattened with time. It's the only disc in this patient's spine where there's a problem. Everything else is absolutely healthy. Now, that itself is not that abnormal if you scan most people above the age of 40 who, who haven't even experienced back pain they'll probably have some changes um, in their discs but it's interesting that this patient only has that segment it's been injected with a steroid as a test and it's improved so in this patient we carried out another investigation called a spect ct scan so some radioactive substance is injected into you, you have a special type of scan done and then highly active cells start to glow and they glow in the same region here as the findings on the MRI scan, if you look between the two. So we've probably got enough information between an MRI scan, a SPEC CT, injections in that region alone, and failed conservative measures. We've got enough ammunition and information to say this is probably the pain generator. So this patient underwent a fusion of the spine <clears throat> where the disc was removed completely, the cage was placed with some screws to hold it together, and their pain settled down. So again, it's a very rare subgroup of patients, but these patients can get good results from surgery. If you found this video helpful, please click the like button and subscribe to the channel. It really helps patients living with back pain or spine disease find information that I try and post on this channel on a weekly basis. Um, the goal at the Spine MDT and in my practice um, is to try and find the least invasive solution that gives you the longest lasting result. And often I can do that uh, by avoiding surgery. Um, the reason I can do that is I work with a whole team of physiotherapists in a network um, and osteopaths. I've even grown the network uh, nationally and I even have therapists abroad so that I can form a sort of package of care with my oversight uh, and good interpretation of your scan findings to try and deliver that result. Uh, please visit our website www.spinemdt.com or email us or call us. We'll be very happy to help you. Thank you.